What is up, everybody? Ron Blue back again on another video for you guys. We are here with Jimi Hendrix Machine Gun. Uh, this is performed with the Band of Gypsies at the Fillmore East. Um, this is a recommendation actually from an interview from Rick Beato with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. And thanks to you all's recommendations, I've checked out both of them. And they said one of the greatest one greatest solos ever was this particular performance. Uh, so we're just going to jump right into it. I love Jimi Hendrix, but I don't remember ever seeing the live version of this. Um, so we're going to just jump right into it without further ado. <laughs> One of the things that just makes this just that much more iconic, it just really speaks to Jimi Hendrix and who he was at the time, a pioneer of uh, what came to be like shredding. What shredding is today is really like he's the root of it. And then on top of that, of course, like the way that he held the guitar, played a right hand upside down, like. I mean, it's just one of the more unique things that you would ever see when it comes down to a pioneer. It's it's easy to say that he literally turned playing the guitar upside down, literally and figuratively. Uh, let's continue. <laughs> Also, too, for what he stood for at that time, you know, he was anti-war. So the uh, Star Spangled Banner now is done on the flute, is done on the guitar, is done on anything, you know, like on the keys, is, is done everything. But like at the time that he did the Star Spangled Banner, like it was considered disrespect, like, um, you know, and it was he was outcast for it. So he's just always been kind of like this political figure as well. Uh, and that adds on to his uh, legacy um, on top of on top of him being an excellent guitarist. But let's continue. <laughs> I'm 
listening to this because the band of gypsies was kind of like towards the end of his life um and career and it's really frustrating because it's like i wonder where he would have taken music he was already bending what people knew to be music at the time it was really just amazing about this performance or just about Jimi hendrix in general was some people liked what he was doing, some people hated it, some people really didn't even consider it as music. Um, there's a lot of performances that I've seen where the audience is just in complete shock. Like, what is happening right now? He's setting a guitar on fire. Um, like, it's literally those type of things where it's like... Um, and then, of course, like, the way that he plays... It's emulated now, so it's hard to imagine. It's emulated so much now, should I say, that it's hard to imagine a time where you are a first-time listener of what shredding is and what that style of playing is and to determine if you like it or not. I think now, as a culture, a music culture specifically that's into blues and rock, I think you grow into liking people like, at least if you don't like Jimi Hendrix, people like Jimi Hendrix or that have been inspired by Jimi Hendrix. Um, but I just can imagine at that time pushing it, even though some people don't like it, some people do. Um, and that's when you that's when you really become the bar of music. It's not necessarily there's plenty of people that came after him. I feel like that could blow him out the water. Like for instance, I just instantly think of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, but there's been there were it was it had to have been at least a ten to fifteen year gap to from. Jimi Hendrix's death to where Stevie Ray Vaughan first came onto the scene and where this style has became kind of more so normal and, and more appreciated. But in the in the time of Jimmy going through, you know, uh, the negative reviews and, and all that, you know, it was, again, it, it's just different. It's interesting to see someone who pushed what we do now in real time every day. And it was so taboo back then. It's just really, really, um, again, it just adds on to his legendary, legendary. And then it was so short too. It was, it was a span of maybe five years um, as far as the, his prominence. Um, I'm not talking about the rise because he played with, um, I'm drawing a blank. The Isley Brothers, he, they, he played with them. He played with, if I'm not mistaken, Little Richard as well. But his prominence was maybe a span of five years. And he did all that 
within five years. That is extremely impressive. Extremely impressive. Um, let's continue. I think what I, another thing that, that's really catching me right now is the fact that the snare sounds very similar to how um, a gun shoots off in, in rounds, so to speak. So it's and then the solo kind of sounds like a little bit more of kind of people screaming like because again he's anti-war. Um, everything that was going on around that time, like so, it kind of, and then of course you can see by the by the music video, you know, uh, this was literally something that he was um, kind of displaying that hey, this is not cool. Essentially, like um, peace, love, and harmony. That's what really he was all about. But it's just again, it's just it's really really. I just cannot get enough of Jimi Hendrix, man, I'm telling you. It's really, really crazy. same way he incorporates that wah wah go back a little a little bit more
guys have to let me know if this is a common knowledge uh, answer, but what gauge of strings did Jimmy play with? He has a lot of confidence in that str in those strings not popping, especially the high E string, the B string. Um, actually, really, those those the last three, but specifically the high E string and the B string. Bending that bending that um, tremolo like that is really one of those things that I'm like, I refrain from personally. Maybe they don't make them the exact same as they used to. But honestly, to me, it, for that style of playing as well, it requires a thicker gauge. I like 10s. Um, I would be surprised if he's playing on 9s, but 10s are higher. Um, that's what I imagine, especially, too, because he always played in um, drop tunings and things like that. So you guys let me know in the comments what uh, if you guys know um, what was his common go-to string gauge? Yeah, look at that. Look at that. He's, he's literally feeding off of the feedback with the tremolo. That's a, that's really insane. We gotta go back. Oh wow! Okay, look at what he's doing. I don't. Yeah, so this is really crazy. Like you, I in a world where there, where technology was limited as far as the effects and everything, he's used, he's tapping the headstock to vibrate the strings to get that unique sound. Um, another thing I was gonna say, going back to the string gauges, he was always tuning them in real time. So I just wonder, um, you know. Nines, nines can't take that type of uh, that type of playing, honestly. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really, really curious about that. Don't you shoot him down? He's about to leave here. Don't you shoot him down? He's got to stay here. He ain't going nowhere. Sound good too.
Absolutely insane, guys. Um, I saw actually, I can't remember somewhere on somewhere in Cobo Hall, downtown Detroit, where he actually played. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it has to be a wall of all the tickets that were that were sold from whenever Cobo Hall was built until. Um, from one time to another, and Jimi Hendrix was in there, and I searched to see if I could find something where someone might have been recording it, couldn't find it. I think if if I'm not mistaken, if if I found anything, it was just straight audio. Um, but this is absolutely insane. And then, so the more and more I actually saw that live, I'm like, it just seems honestly that this was bound to happen. The best way I could describe it is that he was bound to break the barriers because if you're playing the guitar and you pick it up and play it upside down, these sounds and, and the way that he plays was literally bound to happen because you're doing it the unorthodox way as is. Really, really dope to see. Um, Man, I I just ah oh man, it's it's still as as amazing as it is. It's just as frustrating to see that. Um, I wish we could have saw where he would have went in the eighties, especially when you put when you're put up against uh, Jeff Beck, um, Eddie Van Halen, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Like when you put up against those people. Um, do you what what I just wonder where what his sound really he would have evolved to. But in some ways we kind of see it in today's time. Like we see where where it actually has evolved to. I just would have liked to see him himself do it. But it's really dope to see these type of performances. So shout out to Joe Satriani and um Steve Vai for the recommendation, even though they didn't recommend it to me directly, they just said it on Rick uh, Beato's uh, interview together that they did a couple months ago. So shout out to all three of them. If you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to like, share, subscribe to the channel. This is the only channel that you're gonna be getting videos like this, guitar lessons, guitar covers, unboxings, and so much more. Drop those recommendations of songs and guitars that you guys want me to react to. And hit the bell notification button so you know when I shout you guys out. I shout out everybody that I um, do a reaction request from. Until next time, peace.